Welcome to Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast, with your hosts, John Gaspard and me, Jim Cunningham. Hey there, Jim. Hi, Jono. How are you? I'm good. Welcome to season two, episode six. 206, if you're scoring from home. Yeah, chapter six of the Bullet Catch moving right along. Uh, and we've got a fun one today. Uh, we both We're all knew. Fun. Yeah, but we both knew of Jonathan Levitt before this started, but uh, the conversation we're sharing today is highly abbreviated because we chatted for a long time yeah, with Jonathan. Fascinating. 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 You know, uh, uh, let me just be uh, in full transparency here. I have enjoyed absolutely every single interview we've done, bar none. They've all been a delight. Jonathan has so much that relates to what we where we are in this series of books yes he's done what what eli is doing jonathan has done so we had a great time chatting. exactly in the bullet catch eli is acting as a magic consultant for a movie being shot in town and jonathan has done that uh on uh, movies and tv he's uh an actor and a host and he he's uh all around fun guy and a magic creator as well. I, I have uh, a couple of his uh, creations in my bag of tricks, uh, but thanks to the incredible magical mind of Jonathan Levitt. Yes. In addition to all of that, you know, he, as a consultant, uh, he worked on X-Files and as an actor, he's in one of the best episodes of X-Files with Ricky J, which we, we certainly recommend to people. Uh, I first saw him on Celebra Cadabra, which uh, I think you described as uh, Dancing with the Stars for Magicians, which yeah. is a pretty good way of looking at it. He also worked on Now You See Me and the incredible Burt Wonderstone. Which if you have not, folks, if you're listening to this and you have not seen the incredible Burt Wonderstone, uh, I don't want to say stop listening and go watch it because it's not that imperative, but uh, it's not that imperative to this discussion, but it certainly should be on your uh, list of movies to watch. It's a, just a delight as, as is I, you know, I enjoyed now you see me quite a bit as well. You know, I didn't enjoy it as much as you, but in talking to Jonathan about it and he, he explained it very reasonably as uh, he said, John, it's not a magic film. It's a heist film. Yeah. And in that sense, okay. Yeah then I shouldn't be offended, just like people who, who uh, worked uh, in Las Vegas probably looked at Ocean's Eleven and said that could never happen. That's not how anything works here. Right. It's just a heist film. So right. I, I just need to get over it and in some ways over myself. <laughs> You're the least, least over myself kind of guy in my group of friends. Because there's not much to get over. <laughs> Anyway, it was great talking to Jonathan. I've been a big fan for a long time. He is more charming than anyone deserves to be. And in talking with him and getting his experiences, it turns out I wasn't too far off as to how a consultant works on a film or TV set uh, when I wrote about Eli working on the, on the bullet catch. But uh, in this case, uh, at least in the case of Jonathan Levitt, he got his first consulting gig via an acting job in which he was cast as a magician. My first job as consultant was really on my first acting gig. I did an episode of The X-Files. Yes, okay. we love that episode. And that's Ew. a very auspicious way to start acting in Los Angeles. That's not bad. Yeah. With yeah, Ricky yeah. Well, Gay as well, your partner there. Well, you know, my, my honestly, my dream was uh, before I moved to LA, I said, I'm going to move to LA and I'm going to act on the X-Files. That's what I said. Now that is a ridiculous statement to make, but as it turns out, that's what I did. So I'm on, I end up on the X-Files uh, with Ricky Jay. We're both con artist magicians. We were, it was an acting role and I did some magic in it. So that's all fine and good, but they said, hey, we need to teach David and Jillian how to do some magic would you do that? And of course I said, yes. And taught, ended up teaching David Duchovny how to do a coin effect and how, and I taught Jillian how to twist her arm uh, on the floor because I actually had to do that as my character in the, in the, in the role as well. Well, I didn't think anything of it, but later in life, as I'm doing some more consulting and I think back, oh, I was a consultant on the X-Files. So I never thought about it at the time, but that is in fact what I was doing, right? So uh, so that was the, the, the start of it all. 
you know, it's like, great that, you know, your goal was move to LA, be on the X-Files. And then that happens. Did you just turn around and go home then? Or? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. You know, if I were me, I might have just said, I'm packing my stuff and going back to wherever I came from because this was just too easy. Okay, well, first of all, it wasn't easy. Well, no, but, but uh, <laughs> you set a goal and bang, you hit it. That's pretty great. Well, you know what? Here's an interesting thing. Yeah, you're, yes, I did set a goal and I hit it, but not because of, not. yeah, it's weird, you know, how this the stuff kind of happens it just happens, you know, when you have to be ready for you have to be ready for it, right? You have to be prepared for it. it what do they say that, uh, that it's luck. a it's, it's luck and preparation That's meeting, right. luck right? favors the prepared man. That's right. And my father said to me, who's the biggest supporter in my life, my parents are the biggest support uh, that I have, and they're amazing. And so but not even a but I don't want to say but and my father said to me before I moved out to Los Angeles, how long are you going to give it? Two years? And I said, Dad, if I answer the question, I might as well not go. But I booked the X-Files, what was it? Three months after two years. That's still pretty great. It's great. But the point is, if I had said, yes, I'll give it two years, it wouldn't have happened. Right. Were you friends with Ricky at that point? No, I had never met him before. Uh, it was an interesting experience. We, we, in fact, when I got on set the first day, I still didn't know Ricky was booked for it, was cast for it. And the director, who's now a good friend of mine, Thomas Wright, said, you know who we got from Malini, the other character? I said, no, I have no idea. This is the first day on set. He goes, he said, we got Ricky J. And I, and I just thought, what, the, what, the, what is happening? <laughs> uh, and uh, that was great. And so we, we had a good time together. And then I remember a short time after that, I was at my friend Bert Sperber's house. He said, come on over and uh, let's have a little, little uh, gathering. Well, at that gathering was Chris Woodward from the Magic Circle, Mike Caveney, John Gone, Ricky Jay. I, uh, God, you know, I was freaked out. I was you know, nervous. And I remember Bert saying to me, I just want to be a fly on the wall, but Bert saying to me, "Hey, you should do something for 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 all of us. You should perform for all of us." And I said, uh, "You're out of your mind. No way. Go away. Stop talking to me." And then a little later in the party, he said, "Hey, you know what? You really should do a, a trick for all of us." I said, "You're you're crazy. You're out of your mind. Go away." Uh, and then later he said, "You should do something." I said, "Okay, fine. I'll do something." Now, fortunately, I brought something with me, and this was after I had worked with Ricky. So he and I had already worked on the X-Files. And so I, I knew him at that time, but still it wasn't like we were buddies. You know, we were just, we were colleagues and fine. We got along great, you know, no problem. So anyway, I, I came prepared with a trick and I remember I, I did it on the floor. I did a card trick on the floor and I kneeled down, knelt down and intentionally positioned myself so that Ricky was to my left and a little behind me this way. I would not have to look at Ricky and Ricky would not have to look at me. And, uh, and there was a chair right in front of me as it turns out, well, I'm start this thing. And Ricky says, I, I'm sorry, I just can't see. He gets up and he positions himself in the chair directly in front of me. And I think, oh my God, I, what am I, what am I? So I, I power through this thing and, uh, with success. And all I remember is Ricky get, looking at me and giving me a thumbs up. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm so great. And then the next, and then I think it was the next day, the next couple of days uh, after I was at the Magic Castle and I ran into John Gone. And John said, you know, who drove Ricky to the party, he said, all the way home, all he could talk about was that trick. So that's great. Uh, so yeah, there's the thumbs up. Thank you, Jim. And I, I just, I was, I was, uh, I was just so uh, relieved. But anyway, that's my Ricky J stories. Those are my Ricky. It's a great I, Ricky J story. I don't. I have can't Ricky imagine story. doing a card trick in front of Ricky J. That would be the most frightening. It was nerve wracking. Good. It was nerve wracking. Nerve wracking. Yeah. yeah. Terrifying. So, okay, let's get back on track. Yeah, uh, Jim. Do it. I, I can get there because I, I, last night I rewatched uh, the incredible Burt Wonderstone with my oh. wife. And we laughed and laughed and enjoyed every second of it. And I had forgotten how much I enjoyed it the first time I saw it when it had come out. And uh, we just had a grand old time. Uh, talk about being the magic consultant on that film, how that came about. And, you know, what was that whole experience like? Those are some pretty high powered guys you're hanging out with. Yeah. Well, Jim Carrey. 
Yeah, right, right, right. Well, it's important to uh, acknowledge first that the only reason that happened was because of Jim Steinmeier. And I, and, I, and I'll say it here and I'll always say it whenever I get a chance to say it publicly, that all of the great moments in my magic life have been a result of Jim Steinmeier. So with that said, Jim was doing the consultant work on that film in pre-production, putting together a lot of the magic, and they needed somebody on set to work with the actors, to integrate the magic, maybe do some new stuff along the way. And so I spent about four months on that film. I worked with, prior to going into production, I worked with Olivia Wilde and Steve Carell, meeting with them, kind of working on you know, what it means to be a magician, you know, to, how do you move as a magician, et cetera. And then, uh, and then on set, I worked with the two of them and Alan Arkin along the way. And I was always on set, integrating the magic, working with the director and the crew. And, and, um, and that's how it happened. And, and along the way, I also worked on Now You See Me at the same time. For the same, oh, time. same time? Okay. Yeah, for a week. So I, uh, the producers of Now You See Me, reached out to me and said, we would like you to consult and work with our actors on our film, but it was happening at the same time as Burt Wonderstone. So I couldn't do that long on Now You See Me, but there was a week of Burt Wonderstone where they did not need me. They were shooting in Vegas and they didn't need me for that week. And during that one week, I was able to fly out to New Orleans and work on Now You See Me and then come back to Burt Wonderstone for the rest of the run. But so that I was very, uh, very lucky to be able to mix both of them together. But that was a very different experience for both of those, those films. How so? Uh, for Wonderstone, a lot of the magic was practical. We were doing a lot of, we were doing sleight of hand, we were doing, you know, whatever it was, it was practical magic and not CGI. Some of it was CGI, uh, which was another story, but most of it was practical magic. And then for Now You See Me, even though I was teaching them, I was working with, um, Jesse Eisenberg and uh, and uh, Dave Franco mostly a little bit with Isla Fisher, but mostly with um, the two of them. And uh, I was teaching them sleight of hand, teaching them how to do some card work, palm those those ping pong balls, switch those things out, and you know, kind of move as magicians, etc. A lot of the magic in in uh, Now You See Me ended up being CGI, right? Right. So not all of it, but some of you know a lot of it, and it was just a different experience. But also. You had Jesse and Jesse Eisenberg and Dave Franco were were just soaking up the magic, right? Couldn't get enough of it. We would work one day and they say, "Okay, when can we come back and do this again?" You know, let's come back. Can we, how early can we go? You know, they, they were just soaking it up. On the Bert, on Burt Wonderstone, they were doing that. They were loving it, but it was a different kind of a thing. You know, in in a way, it wasn't. In a way, Burt Wonderstone wasn't a magic movie, right? It was a common it was a love comedy you know so but there was magic in it and obviously it was sort of a caricature of magic really fun so the magic was a little bit different for them and oh and by the way i also worked with steve buscemi on burt wonderstone which was amazing as well that, what a mensch that guy is tremendous uh, really fun really fun so anyway they were just they were just different in the in the personalities that i was working with and the the uh kind of the youth of uh dave and jesse Dave Franco and Jesse Eisenberg, and sort of the way they attack the magic uh, versus uh, Burt Wonderstone, but but all dedicated. And Steve Carell on Burt Wonderstone, very dedicated. I was his hands for the majority of that film for, uh, when he was doing magic. Right. But there were some instances where he said, I really want to do this, like the back palm uh, of the card, as an example. You know, he said, I really want to do that. And he really uh, dove in and, and and did that. So we worked together quite a bit on that. So he was very dedicated to it. And that was uh, really nice to see. And then I do have a story about Alan Arkin, if you want to hear it. I, oh, I'm just, oh my I'm God, yes. Yes, just please. Babbling. We love Alan Arkin. We're yeah, because absolutely... talk about consulting. So there I am with Alan Arkin, by the way, in his in his trailer, sitting across from him and just talking about magic and wanting to pinch myself. In fact, I probably was pinching myself under the table. I'm talking to Alan Arkin, uh, which, which is crazy. But I remember there was this scene where he was on stage as a younger Alan Arkin, a younger magician, and he produced he produced an egg in his hand. I'm sit, we're sitting in the I think it was the Orpheum Theater uh, downtown. I think it was the Orpheum Theater. I'm sitting you know uh, a, a row or two behind the director, and Alan Arkin's on stage, and he's doing this bit, and he and they were going to 
put the egg in afterwards in, with uh, at, in post. But so he waves his hand around in a really ridiculous way. And and then, bam, there would be an egg. And I say, Alan, no magician would ever move their hand in that way. It's a ridiculous. It's ridiculous. You're 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 waving your hand way too much. Uh, nobody would do, do that. And then Alan Arkin says to me, "Yes, but my way is funnier." And uh, you that, do you? Gosh darn it, he was right. <laughs> so you watch the you watch the film. You go, "Yeah, that, he's right. That's right. That's better. That's better." <laughs> you know, when I come in and I I I'm doing some magic on a set. Everybody gets to learn how the magic is done. They have to, you know, the, the director has to know, the, the people behind the camera needs, need to know. You know, if, if, they, if they don't know how the magic is done, they won't shoot it right. Right. You know, and, and the goal is not to fool the crew, right? The, 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 the goal is not to fool the crew. The goal is to, to make the magic look good on, on camera. And so for that, we need to, you know, let them behind the curtain. So uh, as a consultant uh, on these films and television shows, especially let's just take Burt Wonderstone where you're there for four months. Every day you're there, are people coming up to you? Hey, do a trick, you got, uh, what do you got? And are you just like loaded down with decks of cards and coins and you know sponge balls in case somebody on the craft services crew says, do something for us? No. Wow, that's great. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure I did a trick or two, but my job was not there to perform magic. My job was there to help the, the, the production move forward. You know, that's the other thing as a consultant, your job is to move the production forward, not to stall. So in other words, when we did, uh, we did a levitate, mo these are mostly magicians listening to this podcast, I think, yeah? Um, no, it's mystery. No. Readers. Okay. So what we, we generally don't give things away. We'll talk in we'll talk okay. in a in a pendulette sort of way around things. Understood. Okay. So we had a we had a scene that involved the levitation. And there are some mechanics to make that happen. And it's possible that that needs to be reset, right? If there's a mishap, or we cut and we go to another take of it. To make that happen, I spent the entire night beforehand making oodles and oodles of these mechanics ready to go for multiple takes mm. for problems that would happen during the take or multiple takes because the job is cut run in fix get out and keep the production moving forward and that's the key right so my job is to keep it moving forward it's not to stop things down it's not to have a laugh the last thing you want to be on set is the one who stalled the production, Sure. right? You don't wanna be that person. So whatever you can do, you don't wanna be that person. So I didn't go in prepared to perform magic. I came in there prepared to help integrate the magic into the production. When I first started writing the Eli Marks series, which is seven books now, it's about a magician. It's about a working magician. I am not a magician. I have no training in magic to learn the ambitious card trick for the first book, I, I learned that uh, a first uh, world-class magician lived in the Twin Cities named Suzanne. I took lessons from her, learned how to do that. But I had a huge learning curve to get over in order to write that first book because it had it was all first person. It's from the point of view of Eli Marks. And he is talking about his life as a magician, which isn't just as the copywriter who wrote the first blurb wrote for it said, it isn't all kitty shows and card tricks. There's a life to it, a lifestyle to it. Suzanne was a huge help in, in kind of giving me that sense of the day-to-day -day life of magician. But at the same time, uh, this show, Celebra Cadabra, had, I think, just been on. I was able to buy it on iTunes, and it gave me sort of a boot camp into all the different styles of magic and uh, how people learn magic, although it didn't give anything away. But it showed the frustration. It, it showed the I mean, there was a variety of personalities, not only in the celebrities, but also in the, certainly in the magicians. And it was a huge help. And probably the first person to appear on screen is a guy named Jonathan Levitt, who mm. is not only, you're not only the host of it, but you're also sometimes a judge and you're there, you, ubiquitous throughout and you're doing magic and you're hosting and you're being charming and doing all that. And I've always associated that first book with this sort of charming guy, a uh, Jonathan Levitt type, because that was the first thing that came out throughout those whatever six or seven or eight episodes was this one figure. Can you talk a little bit about 
your role on that show, how they approached you, and any sort of magic consultant twist to what you were doing there? Wow. Well, first of all, thank you for sharing that story. That is really, uh, that makes me feel great. And I appreciate it so much. Celebra Cadabra, I'm again, thank you to Jim Steinmeier and David Regal for suggesting me for it. Uh, th this was a, um, a celebrity, you know, like a Dancing with the Stars with Magic, right? So you had uh, celebrities paired up with magicians as, as their coaches, and the celebrities were learning magic and competing each week in a different style of magic and what have you. Great. I mean, really a fun show I mean, at the end of the day. And so they needed a host and and I was also the, the primary judge, right? And I would judge alongside Jeff McBride and Max Maven, in some cases, Fran Sorari. And we would, we, but Jeff and, and Max were the, were the primary judges next to me. And, and I would host the show as well. So I wasn't really a consultant on that show because we had seven other consultants on that show as coaches. Right. So you didn't really need me as a consultant, but I was doing magic, as you said, in the in the opening bits, uh, every episode, I would do some magic, you know, so I was in a, in a way consulting in, in the sense that I had a, a say in creatively what we were doing, but I wasn't I wasn't billed as a consultant on that show. Uh, but I have to say, so this was they were looking for I, I'll I'll exp I'm happy to tell you the audacity that I had at the time, uh, because I was doing other hosting work. You know, I was hosting other TV shows and they they were doing a search for the, the coaches for this show. And they were kind of searching all of, all over the globe for coaches. And uh, and so I went in and they brought me in to to to, uh, to interview for the, for that position uh, for one of the coaches. And I remember saying to them, you know, I really should be the host of this show. And they said, <laughs> and I'm pretty sure it couldn't have been more than four seconds later. They said, hey, thanks so much for coming in. Please don't <laughs> let the door hit you on the way out. So, and I, you know, that was it, right? And so then they did a pilot. They did a pilot with a non-magician host. And I don't think it did. I don't think it was well received. I don't think it aired. I don't think the pilot aired, but I don't think it was well received. And so they said, well, we need another host. So they reached out to Jim and David, and they both said, you should talk to Jonathan. So at that point, I remember where I was. I was actually filming a short film at the time, and I got a phone call from Chris Martin, who said, hey, are you still interested in hosting this thing? I said, yeah, I am. And, and that was it. So uh, that was it was a great experience. You know, we shot that over six weeks, shot at the Magic Castle as our base camp, and we were in Las Vegas for the final episode and uh and it was i always say it was like going to war it was really a hard schedule uh but it was it was awesome just awesome it's a really fun show and i recommend if you can track it down anybody should watch it because it it really does give you the feel of what is it like to learn something and and then have you know learning is one thing walking out onto a promenade somewhere and trying to gather a crowd and and do it uh it, it's even with quote unquote performers these people are performers yet you add the you know the element of having to perform magic to it it's a it's a whole different world yeah. and i'll tell you they did great actors have a a, 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 an ability, you know, David Duchovny, uh, I went, I had to teach him how to vanish a coin. And so I said, well, okay, I'll give you three options. The third option was the Goshman pinch, which is not easy. And he goes, oh, that's the one we'll do. I'll do that one. Okay. And man, he picked it up, you know, like a champ. They're great. I mean, actors really have an ability to learn, a you know, learn stuff right in the moment. And Celebra Dabra, they, it was great to see. And see Thomas Howell, who won, he did a great, great job. You know, he really killed it. And I give him a lot of credit for it, a lot of credit. And, you know, in some cases, we'd watch those acts and we'd, we'd go, you know what? That's better than most magicians I've seen these days. Yeah. You know, really well thought out, well acted, great story, you know, really terrific. And a lot of that, by the way, has to go, credit has to go to David Regal for, for being his coach. Yeah. That show uh, made me think of, I think it's the Henning Nelms line about uh, a magician is an actor playing the part of a magician. And C. Thomas Howell, I thought was brilliant 
uh, at doing that. And the, the way he was coached up and delivered that final, it was just like, wow, that's terrific. And yeah, he, yeah, it was just amazing to me. He, he took on that role wonderfully. And he, and he really committed himself to the work and the practice. And he deserves all the credit. He really did a great job. Yeah, yeah. No, it was a great show. I enjoyed every minute of it. Thanks. John, are you good? Because I just want to ask about, uh, you know, uh, how magic is, if you, John spends an inordinate amount of time, I think, making sure in his books that he gets the life of a magician right, that uh, the magic is treated respectfully, his concerns are real concerns of a magician, it's not at all kind of fabricated, it's grounded in reality so that if a magician is reading the book, he's not going to go, well, that's just a bunch of crap. Uh, it's really right there and very real. Can you talk at all or think of some examples of shows or movies where, where you think the magic was really presented well? That, that was great. They did a great job. Well, I think they did it in, in The Incredible World of Wonderstone. I think they did a really good job of presenting the magic because a lot of it was practical magic. You know, it was not fantastical magic. You know, there was one scene where a couple, maybe two, a couple of scenes that I can think of that were some CGI replacement, but mostly it was all practical magic. And I think they did a really good job with it. You know, magic's really hard to present on camera, really hard. So yeah, I mean, it can, it can be done. It's not easy, but it, the hardest thing to do is to integrate magic into a storyline, into a, into an, un, into a scripted storyline. That, that's not, e that's not easy, right? If you're just, showing magic as as you know here's the magic being performed with no it's not a theatrical you know it's not a uh, a scripted piece it's it's just here's the magic that's a little bit easier although you have to watch the camera angles and you you should have a magician in the editing room you should editors will miss things you know that a flash may happen that they won't see necessarily right you know and a flash is when we expose something right, right. And we don't want to do that so an editor in the a magician in the editing room is really important if you're going to be putting it into any kind of context, whether it be scripted or or even if it's just the magic as as the magic, uh, not in the scripted situation. You you want to make sure that you're you're presenting it well and not flashing and, and, and doing all that without doing camera. If you can avoid doing camera tricks, that's even better. You know, you're not trying to you're not trying to fake the audience out. You know, I mean, if you look at Copperfield. Copperfield mastered magic on television. And I was always fascinated because when you go see his live show, there wasn't really a difference, you know? He was he was able to make us feel like we were watching on television what we would see live. Right. And that's difficult. You know, when I mentioned that, you know, Celebr Cadabra was something that was very helpful for me starting out. At the same time, I also tracked down and watched episodes of uh, Hal Linden's show, Black's Magic, mm -hmm. and Bill Bixby and The Magician and didn't finish either one of them because they almost immediately start doing things that you just can't do. They're not only breaking the laws of physics, but breaking the laws of what a magician can do. For example, Hal Linden's in the middle of a ballroom at someone's house. He set up uh, some sort of glass box. He steps into the box, smoke comes out and they cut and he is now at the other side of the house and he's going through their safe or something. I mean, it's, it's like, well, if we're going to use the magic, we need to be realistic about it, which is one of the things I loved about Burt Wonderstone is, yes, there's a little bit of, they push the edge a little bit, but it really is actual kind of magic tricks. You know, the ultimate illusion in it at the end, when they drug the audience and drag them to the desert, is physically doing what Teller has said about magic, which is magic is someone who's willing to just go up to a lot further extremes than you might think reasonable. And that's a perfect example of doing that to get to get the effect. And that's why, as I weigh, uh, and, and you're not here to review these films you worked on, but as I weigh Burt Wonderstone against Now You See Me, I'm with Burt Wonderstone the whole time, because like you say, it's practical magic. And they're really doing it as soon as the river of blood or whatever starts. And now you see me and you go, well, that's okay. This is just Harry Potter. This is not, these aren't real magicians. Right. And I'm no longer watching it from that point of view. Right. right. And I think it's important, you know, when you watch a movie like now you see me, it's not a magic movie, right? It's a heist movie. Right. Yeah. You need to sort of remove yourself from it. You know, Harry Potter is not a magic movie. You know, I mean, in the sense of watching Practical Magic, it's a magical movie. 
right? It's right. a fantastical movie and you go into it expecting that. Now there's magic consultants that were working on Harry Potter to make some of the magic happen. It wasn't all CGI mm -hmm. and there's practical magic in Harry Potter, some really good practical magic. And so, but, but you don't go into it going, I can't wait to see a magician do magic. You're going into it knowing you're, you're seeing a wizard do some wizardry, right? right. And, and so, yeah, it's important to understand what that, you know, so now you see me, yeah, as long as you can say, I'm going to separate myself from this. I'm not going in to watch, you know, my favorite magician on screen. I'm going in to watch a heist movie with magic elements. And, and I, that's a really, it's important to, to couch it and, and to set your expectations before going in, I suppose. Okay, so you've got all these clubs in your bag, right? You can be an actor, you can be a host, you can be a spokesperson, you can be a magician, you can be a magic consultant. Is there one thing that you go, gosh, I, you know, if I had to pick one club that I was gonna, this would be the one that I would, I wish I could put all my eggs in that basket. Uh, the short answer is no. The longer answer is I wish yes. Uh, we were just having this conversation the other day. You know, it's you think about it. If if you put everything into one of those, and boy, what a force that could be. But the other side of it is, I enjoy making my mind go in different directions. I enjoy that. I mean, I do, I do enjoy it. I think that if I were in a situation where I said, okay, I'm just going to do one thing, this one thing only, that I would miss doing the other things. And I feel like I'm at a point in my life. I just turned fifty. And I'm, I think at that point, if I were just to kind of put all that other stuff away, I think I would really have a, 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 a hole in my soul, you know, why, craving the ability to do all those other things, you know, because that's those, those, those bring on their life experiences that I mean, I'm really blessed. The life experiences that we have and the travel that we've been able to have, you know, it's, it's fantastic. I, I love being able to juggle all those things. So I think the answer is, no, I'm good. I'm good. Yes, you are. So you've done this consulting, you've done acting, you've, you've, you've got this, as Jim said, this, this bag of clubs to deal with. I understand you're also now kind of taking the movie consulting and focusing it down on, on helping individual magicians and ah. working with them. What is that process like? Boy, that has been so gratifying. Uh, co coaching other performers, other magicians, mostly magicians, but other performers in general, but but working with them on their acts and their effects, but not just, it, it ends up not just being an individual effect. Some, some, some magicians have come to me and say, I want to work on one trick and work on the methodology of that one trick or the story of that one trick, but it always invariably evolves into so much more. And we end up talking about their character and their o their overall show and the structure within their show and the, the way they handle the audience and the through line of the show and the story and the scripting and all of it as it works together. And uh, it has been so satisfying for me uh, to work with individuals in this way and uh, and really help evolve uh, and what their overall uh, performance and their overall act and really help them understand who their character is. And I've been doing that quite a bit. Uh, I've always done it, but over the last 14 months, I really dove into it. And now it's become a sort of a major part of what I'm doing on a, on a somewhat daily basis is working with individuals like this. And, and everybody's different. And I've had, I've had days where I've had several people back to back. And when I move from one person to the next, it's a completely different conversation because each person is individual. And part of what we do, you know, in our opening session is usually just a conversation, finding out about that person, a, a lot of listening uh, and, and asking questions and, and taking notes and allowing that information to, to drive us forward in the next sessions and change the way people think about the way they perform and the way they present themselves. And we've had major breakthroughs uh, that have been, in, in some cases, emotional. And uh, it's, been, it's been really gratifying uh, doing the magic coaching. So I'm, I'm glad to be doing it and continue doing it. You know, of all the things that he talked about in uh, a far-ranging interview, the one that sticks with me and to hear him say it again was so chilling, was performing a card trick in front of Ricky Jay. Ricky J, yes, but that room was chock-a-block full of uh, the magic hoi polloi 
And here's a guy on the ground doing a card trick for some of the best in the business. Uh, it would be like uh, getting a bunch of Royal Shakespeare actors together, your Patrick Stewart's, your Ian McKellen's and saying, hey, I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna do a monologue from Hamlet now. Watch this guys, out of your mind crazy. Uh, so happy that it worked and, and happy that uh, Ricky Jay talked all the way home about that card trick. Good for you, Jonathan. You know, on a similar note, Kenneth Branagh spoke about when he made his version of Hamlet, which is a pretty good version of Hamlet, I think. I love it. That Derek Jacoby played Claudius in that and had quite famously played Hamlet uh, in his younger days and was not opposed to if uh, Kenneth Branagh went up on a line, just picking it up and continuing. He would just pick up Hamlet's lines for him. And that's sort of the similar thing to, to doing card trick in front of Ricky Jay would be performing uh, Shakespeare in front of one of those guys. No, and do you know this? Uh, here's a little sidebar. This is a Shakespeare thing, but there is a, uh, a script of Hamlet that has been passed on generation to generation to generation to what is that sort of that generation's quintessential Hamlet. Derek Jacoby got it, I think, from, I'm going to say Laurence Olivier, that could be wrong, but it, it's that kind of pedigree. And, it, and Laurence Olivier got it from, and it, and it, it came down for a hundred years. J Jacoby gave it to Kenneth Branagh. I don't know if Kenneth Branagh has given oh. it to anybody else. So. Well, they certainly would have had some options. Of yeah, people he could have given it to because it could have gone to David Tennant. It could have, I could have gone to Simon Russell Beale, which is of all the ones I never saw. The Simon Russell Beale Hamlet is one that I find most interesting because he played him as a uh, <laughs> an older, heavy grad student, basically. Anyway, I'm glad that I'm not a performer and I don't have to do that sort of thing in in front of, you know, just doing a card trick in front of John Carney once was uh, all I needed. Well, you know, John, essentially that's why I don't perform magic it's just even even if there aren't magicians in the audience i just find it too darn nerve-wracking i i can gear up for one uh, one run of one show a year but it's i just it's too nerve-wracking it, it uh, makes you old before your time or at least it makes me old before my time it's scary yeah. so yeah that, but, then now you add you ladle in ricky J and all the other great magicians that are in that room, I would not have had, frankly, the courage ever to do something like that. So Jonathan Levitt, thank you so much for chatting with us. Uh, if you want to uh, check out the show notes, we have a link to Jonathan performing at the Magic Castle and some outtakes from his work on Celebra Cadabra. You, if you're a fan of this podcast, you'd be a fan of, of that show as well. I, I, it's, I, I think it's very watchable and very fun. It is. I wish there were more of them. It was really yeah. nicely produced. Um, I agree. Right. Yeah. We, we also have on in the show notes uh, a link to the promo video for Jonathan's performance on the X-Files and where he was not only acting, but acting as a consultant. And speaking of being a magic consultant here, I am the king of the segues. You didn't think I could do it, but I've done it. That brings us to chapter six of the bullet catch. Uh, if you remember in chapter five, we spent a little more time at the uh, at the high school reunion with Trish. We met her husband. We had a kind of scary elevator ride for Eli, who's still suffering his pain panic attacks. And um, then uh, she headed home and we realized that she was going to be a widow the next time we saw her, which brings us now right into chapter six. The Bullet Catch, an Eli Marks mystery. Chapter six. The ride home from downtown consisted almost entirely of a nonstop monologue from Jake. The subjects he covered alternated between his shame and embarrassment at bombing during his card tricks to his continued amazement at how beautiful and charming Trish was. You don't see a woman like that very often, he said wistfully as we made nice time heading south on Portland Avenue. Yes, I agreed. Good thing you came back to Minneapolis. I understand Los Angeles is bereft of beautiful women. They're not as many as you might think, Jake said defensively. So many that you have to come all the way back here to find one? I don't know about that, he admitted. But I will admit, I have started looking outside of L.A. County. He turned left on 48th Street. 
Two blocks and one right turn later, he deposited me in front of Chicago Magic. I still can't believe I screwed up that trick so badly, he repeated for the umpteenth time as I opened the passenger door. It's just a matter of practicing, I said. I practice all the time, he countered. Yes, I said, but practicing in front of a mirror is not the same as practicing in front of an audience. You need to get some actual crowd time under your belt. As Mac King always says, whoever has the most stage time wins. And how does one do that? I thought about it for a second. Well, I could always get you into a First Thursday show. What's First Thursday? Once a month, my uncle and his cronies take over the Parkway Theater, I said, gesturing to the movie theater next to Chicago Magic, and put on a show. It's not highly structured or, for that matter, particularly well advertised. It's just a chance for them to get in front of an audience and keep their magic muscles limber. First Thursday, he repeated quietly. That might be a good idea. When is it? Surprisingly, it's on a Thursday, I said, although my joke went right over his head. And as it turns out, it's this Thursday. And can you get me in? He asked, clearly warming to the idea. I'll see if I can pull some strings, I said, as I stepped out of the car. Great. That's just what I need, Jake said, considering the opportunity. He then smiled his million-dollar smile up at me. Well, as we say in the business, I'll see you on the set. I closed the car door, and he executed a sharp U-turn, hitting the gas and just making it through the third second of the yellow light. Not only did I fall asleep the moment I got into bed, I'd be willing to bet I was already in REM sleep before my head hit the pillow. It had been a long day, ending with too much alcohol and way too much proximity to a 40-story vertical drop. I was exhausted, so I can probably be excused for not hearing the front door to my apartment as it opened and closed. I also didn't hear the bedroom door open, and I didn't hear anyone walk across the room and lean over my bed. The first thing I heard was my name, whispered softly. I immediately incorporated the sound into a dream where I was backing away on the roof of a super-tall skyscraper with only a thin railing separating me from what looked like a 200-story drop. Someone called my name from somewhere above me, and then called it again, and then placed a hand on my chest. I woke up with a start, grabbing the dream hand and realizing it was a real hand attached to a real wrist. In the dark room, I could barely make out the silhouette of a figure leaning over me. She said my name again. Eli. Megan, I said. Not sure if this was a new chapter in the dream or if I were actually back in my room. Yes. I recognized her voice and could start to make out her features in the dim light. What are you doing here? I'm not here, she said quietly. You're not? I'm not here. Okay. She leaned in and kissed me, and I woke up enough to kiss her back. A moment later... She was in bed alongside me, and everything began to feel very familiar. Although somewhat rusty, we both got back in the rhythm very quickly, and before I knew it, it was like she had never left. Afterward, she lay next to me quietly, each of us listening to the other's breathing as our heart rates returned to normal. So, I finally said, here we are. I'm not here, she said. I think I could make a persuasive argument to the contrary. She rolled over and kissed me, then jumped up and grabbed her clothes as she headed toward the door. I wasn't here, she said one last time. Then the door closed behind her. I lay in the bed for a long while, and then for a while longer, and then for a bit more. Finally, I rolled over and went back to sleep. The next morning, I turned off the alarm when it started ringing, deciding I deserved to sleep in, if only for a bit. Once I finally rolled out of bed, I took a quick shower, spending most of its duration trying to clean off the recalcitrant ink spot on my hand from the previous night's reunion. I then made my way down the two steep flights of stairs to the magic shop, 
figuring Harry had already finished his breakfast and had opened the shop. The lights were on in the store, but Harry was nowhere to be seen. I was about to turn around and go back up and check his apartment when the bell over the door tinkled. I turned, expecting to see Harry holding our traditional Saturday morning treat, a bag of warm croissants and two hot cups of coffee. No such luck. It was instead my ex-wife's relatively new husband, homicide detective Fred Hutton. Morning, Marks, he growled, his large frame filling the doorway and blocking the early morning sun. Homicide detective Fred Hutton, to what do I owe the pleasure? Is this a personal call or are you here on business? At one point, I had promised to stop always referring to him by his full name and title, but some habits die hard. He didn't seem to care one way or the other. You attended a function last night downtown, a high school reunion? I did. I did indeed, I said, getting a bit anxious about the reason behind his visit. Is there a problem? Underage drinking, undocumented workers, excessive jaywalking, or something more severe? You spent some time with Dylan LaSalle? I did, briefly. To be honest, I spent more time with his wife, but I did interact with him once or twice. Why, what's he done? He's gotten himself killed, he said dryly. Homicide detective Fred Hutton is not, by anyone's estimation, a chatty guy, so it took me a while to pull the whole story out of him. The gist of it was that sometime around 2 a.m., Dylan decided to go for a late-night run. His body was discovered by some early-morning joggers, just a few feet from a running path near the Lake Calhoun condo he shares with his wife. He had been shot twice, once in the chest and once in the head. His wallet was found nearby with ID intact but no cash or credit cards. He was assumed to be the victim of a mugging, but the police were contacting anyone who had interacted with him in the last day or so. We talked to a lot of people at the reunion, I said, after some of the initial shock had worn off. Well, he talked to a lot of women, at least. Yes, we have a complete list of all the attendees. Since I recognized your name on the list, I thought I'd make you one of my first stops. Well, I'm flattered, of course. I said, forgetting for a moment that humor and sarcasm were foreign to homicide detective Fred Hutton's experience. But other than last night, I haven't seen him since high school, and even back then, we never traveled in the same circles. What kind of guy was he? he asked, flipping open a small notebook and then looking at me intently, waiting for my reply. Well, like I said, I didn't know him well, then or now. I've always known you to be an astute judge of character, he said with the straightest of faces. What was your impression of him? Well, I finally said, I don't want to speak ill of the dead, but he was sort of a creep, then and now. How so? I struggled to put the feeling into words. I don't know, I said, groping for the right adjective. I guess he always acted kind of... Shady. Shady. I see. He made several notes, making me wonder what he was jotting down other than the word shady. He looked up from his work. And how well do you know his wife? Really no better than I knew him, I admitted, although I did spend more time with her last night than with him. And why was that? His question was completely straightforward and devoid of judgment, yet I couldn't help feel trapped by it. I don't know, I said. He was playing the room, so I sat and chatted with her. She was popular in school. I always found her interesting. My voice trailed off, not sure how this information could possibly assist him in his investigation. I see, he said, checking through his notes. And how would you describe his relationship with his wife? His wife? You said you spent a good deal of time talking with her. What was your impression of the state of their marriage? Well, I'm really not sure it's my place to say. He plowed on. Did it seem strained in any way? I hemmed and perhaps even hawed to a degree before answering. He had a lot to drink, I finally said. 
and I got the impression that wasn't uncommon. Anything else? He spent a lot of time flirting with other women, and I got the impression that also wasn't uncommon. There was an uncomfortable silence, at least for me, while he made some more notes. So that's what you think it was? I asked. A mugging? Probably, he said, looking up from his notes. The simplest answer is usually the right one. Occam's razor, I said. He nodded and almost smiled. Yes, Occam's razor. When you have two competing theories that make exactly the same prediction, the simpler one is the better. Well, what's the other theory? He waited a moment before responding. That it was more than just a mugging. He closed his notebook. Thanks for your time. As he reached the door, I felt the need to add one more unrelated thought. One more thing, I said. He stopped and turned, waiting for me to complete my thought. I came out from behind the counter and cut the distance between us. There had been something I had been wanting to say to him for a long time, and this seemed like as good a time as any. I know we've never really talked about you and Deirdre, the affair you two had. He waited quietly for me to continue, no expression on his face. I just don't want you to feel like you owe me anything, I said, because of the affair. I don't. I don't want you to think that you're... I struggled to find the right word. That you're beholden to me. I don't. Because you aren't beholden to me. I know. He continued to stare at me. His face was expressionless. But in my mind, I attached a flood of possible emotions to his blank countenance. Have a nice day, he said flatly as he left the store. Look at there. Once again, Eli, suspect for murder. Two books, twice he's been a suspect. Yeah, I did try to limit that. It does happen in the first couple of books, but I don't think it really happens again until the seventh book. And there's a couple of stories in the eighth book, The Self-Working Trick, where he is a suspect. It just, I felt like it, it's kind of an old trope. Uh, it just ha happen, can happen too often in, in some of these series. Um, you know, uh, Miss Marple was never really a suspect. Hercule Perot was never a suspect. Angela Lansbury yeah. wasn't a So, you know, it's just a question of getting him in situations where he, he can be helpful, but always having to be a suspect, I thought would get old quickly. So I didn't do it that often. No, you're, you're a smarter man than I am, because uh, once I find something that works, I stick with it. Anyway, in our next episode, we're going to continue uh, looking at this idea of being a magic consultant with magician John Armstrong. In preparation for that episode, I would recommend you check out a documentary he was in called Magician's Life in the Impossible. I believe it's available in a lot of streaming services. It captures John in his early years. Uh, also looks at a number of other magicians, one who has since died and one who has since gone to jail, which should be enough right there for you to well, want to watch Well, now I'm it. intrigued. I'm going to have to watch that because I have not seen it yet. It does a good job of saying, hey, a magician is not one thing. It's all these different things. So definitely worth checking it out. In addition to being the co-host of this podcast, I'm also a fan of this podcast because I generally find something in every podcast that I go, oh, I didn't know about that. Uh, there's a, I didn't know about that. I'm going to have to watch it. So yeah, I appreciate it, John. On behalf of all of us who are uh, tuning into this podcast, thank you. That's a good tip. I will watch it. All right. Yeah, John has John Armstrong, not John. Not Armstrong. John Gaspard, no. John and not Armstrong. Jonathan Levitt either. It's and a not lot Jonathan of Levitt. We're in a series of Johns here, but this John Armstrong that we're talking about who's coming up, uh, he has worked as a magic consultant. We're going to get his stories uh, along with some thoughts on what it means to be a good magician. Plus, he's going to talk to us about his experience on Penn and Teller's Fool Us, giving us an inside look at what happens when magicians argue with Penn and Teller about their judgments. Yeah, spoiler alert, John Armstrong did not argue with them. No, no. What would a smart guy do? He wouldn't argue with Penn. That's one thing he wouldn't do. 
We would not, totally. Uh, speaking of Fool Us, uh, in the episode after that one, uh, we're going to be chatting with uh, Michael Close about the whole Fool Us process. He's one of the behind the scenes people at uh, Fool Us who doesn't necessarily help in the selection of the magicians, but does help them get camera ready. And his uh, his insights are about how magic works on TV and in front of a camera are really interesting. So that'll be in the episode after the next John Armstrong episode. And then we're going to dive deeper into our How to Build a Magician series. We're going to talk to magic store owner Larry Kalo, who I believe owns the longest continuing magic store in America, Eagle Magic right here in Minnesota. Um, we're gonna get great advice from all kinds of magicians. Our pal, Noah Sony, uh, who else? Kayla Drescher is gonna come up, uh, Ryan Kane, your pal. Oh, Harrison Greenbaum. <laughs> Harrison you know, Greenbaum. Tell me, who, when you say your pal, I know who you're talking about. We're not friends. Harrison Greenbaum and I are not friends by any stretch of the imagination, but he made me laugh from the beginning of that episode. Yeah right through the end what a charming funny funny guy he is yes a good magician a, to boot a very good magician and then uh further down the line we're going to chat with uh for those of you who were youngsters and uh opened a box of cheerios and found a magic trick uh we're going to talk to the guy who did that who gave you those magic tricks dan witowski uh talking about the two billion magical promotions that he was involved with uh over the years he actually uh in a show i was in here in St. Paul in the mid 80s, he designed an illusion and hand taught me uh, how to perform that illusion in front of an audience. Dan Witowski, a great guy. Yeah, we have some really great uh, names coming up, including a big one that I think we'll just say we have a big name coming. I don't know how much more you want to say about it right now. It's going to be a two parter. Uh, it'll be toward the end of the season, uh, but it was uh, a nice get, I think. And yeah, a great it really time. was fascinating fascinating so that's coming up later all kinds of reasons to subscribe hit that subscribe button and all kinds of reasons to give us a nice rating so that other people find us we don't care if you like us that's not why we're asking about the ratings what the rating thing does is it makes the algorithm go oh i should tell other people about this so they can listen to it as well exactly so uh please uh, subscribe if you haven't already and uh give us a give us a rating so that other people like you who might enjoy this will uh, stumble on us and go, what, who, what, who what? are these idiots? And why are they allowed to talk to these great people? Oh boy. Anyway, uh, that's it for 206. We'll see you next time on 207 with our good friend, John Armstrong. Take care. Bye-bye everybody. This has been Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and Jim Cunningham, produced by Albert's Bridge Books at Grass Lake Studios. Find this podcast and all the books in the Eli Marks series at elimarksmysteries.com. That's E-L-I-M-A-R-K-S, mysteries.com. And thanks for listening. Thank you.